after that I come back to my work dress. Because of the ball? Sure. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julie Joffrey. I'm the Intervention Specialist with the Elite Graduate Program. And today we are really proud to uh, host Martin Pace here talking about his internship with the United Nations. Martin is a graduate student in the MBA program. And he told me he's graduating in December. Woohoo! He's also an elite cohort member. Let's welcome Martin. Well, um, first off, thank you all for coming today. Um, it's nice to have a good turnout and something like this. Um, basically, today I'm going to be talking about my internship that I recently completed at the United Nations headquarters in New York. And um, it was such a wonderful opportunity uh, that I'm hoping that I can motivate other students on campus to apply for it um, and, and go and do what I did because it was just uh, so great. Uh, so I'm going to kind of introduce you to a little bit of the UN and um, talk a little bit about the internship program and kind of mix in some of my experiences. Um, so the UN was founded in 1945 after World War II. Um, the original reason it kind of came about is because before it, the League of Nations had kind of failed to prevent the world wars we saw. And people were kind of worried about the future of humanity if we continued down the kind of path that we were. And World War II had sobered us up to things like um, genocides and ethnic cleansings with the Holocaust and the first exercising of nuclear power, of uh, dropping the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and uh, just the warfare in general. So that was really the original reason for its founding was international peace and security. But today, it's grown to become much larger, and it has much more far-reaching aims. Uh, and it's not just about international peace and security. It's about anti-colonialism and uh, promoting self-determination. So when these colonial powers step back from the countries they're controlling, uh, democratization occurs. And so the UN has always tried to assist them in that transition by helping set up polling stations, helping them organize elections, and things of that nature. And it also now serves um, to tackle economic development issues, so uh, things like water, uh, disease, extreme poverty, hunger, um, and promote the economic well-being of the developing countries. It also attempts to propagate human rights. Um, shortly after it was founded, it made a declaration of uni the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And um, it's ever since been seeking to propagate that around the world so that those rights will be recognized and uh, protected. And punishing crimes against humanity is important. We now have things like the International Court of Justice, uh, the International Criminal Court, and the uh, Criminal Tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia. Uh, because before we had any of these institutions, we had no real way to maintain international accountability and punish these kinds of unique crimes. Uh, and also, it's a kind of a leader in humanitarian efforts, um, providing disaster relief, but also tackling some of the more pressing uh, development issues. And it's uh, bigger now. It's 192 states. So it's very big. Uh, when you're at the the UN in New York, uh, there's kind of an unofficial motto that you'll hear, and it's uh, when nobody else cares, the UN is there. And I, I found just some pictures that represent kind of the front end of what the UN does. Um, over on the left, there's um, a UN medic treating a survivor of a building collapse in Haiti. And then in the top center, a child is helping a peacekeeper organize shoes uh, that are going to be passed out to survivors. And the top right, there's UN peacekeepers escorting uh, refugees in Darfur, where there's been genocide ongoing on and off since 2003. Uh, the bottom center, I picked that picture because it's kind of unique. Um, that's an all-female police force that kind of voluntarily formed in Bangladesh. And then they came to Haiti to work alongside UN personnel um, to provide kind of a sensitive uh, police force uh, that, that's sensitive to women and children. 
Um, and then on the bottom right, we have peacekeepers rescuing a child um, following the earthquakes in Haiti. Um, so I'm here today to talk about internship opportunities at the UN, but more specifically, the UN internship program at the headquarters in New York, which is uh, the one that I participated in. Um, but there's many others uh, at the alternative duty stations around the world uh, with the UN Foundation um, and then some of these other organizations that are major branches of the UN. Uh, and down here I have a link, which I'll have later on. Um, it lists, it, it's a, a much more comprehensive list, it's very long, of all the internships uh, that are offered elsewhere throughout the UN system. But I'll have that link again uh, towards the end. So the UN internship program at the headquarters in New York has offered uh, three sessions throughout the year, fall, spring, and summer. Uh, it's highly competitive because most of the applicants are graduate students and they're from all around the world. Um, and a lot of people apply. Each session is about 7,000 from which they take about 200, uh, give or take. And this was my group. There was about 205 of us. Um, and we had a photo op with the current Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. He's down there in the center. And uh, this, we're in the rotunda of the General Assembly Chamber. And then after the photo op, he gave us a nice 25 minutes um, inspirational talk. It was very uh, interesting. And then afterwards, he was going down the line and shaking people's hands. And so everyone was lining up to try to get their handshake. I got mine, of course. but. Um, so that was very exciting to meet him. Uh, so an important part of why I pursued the internship is that I've always wanted to live and work abroad. Um, I don't really know how to explain why. It's just always, I've always had an interest in, um, you know, meeting new people from around the world, going and seeing things, exchanging cultures and so forth. And the UN was a great way to do that. It's much you know, like an opportunity would be working with a multinational company where you get to just meet people from all over. And um, the UN is aligned with some of my personal long-term aspirations, which are to create new businesses or nonprofits that address uh, development issues in some way. And one that's really important to me is um, water access, clean, safe drinking water and uh, sanitation because I feel that that's at the root of most other development problems. And um, of course, the UN looks good on a resume, so that was another plus. And I also um, have always, I've always wanted to live and work abroad, but I've never really had a lot of support or understanding for people around me and why I wanted to do so. But I've, I've had, I have an array of friends that uh, over the past several years have really kind of pushed me to start taking real steps towards living and working abroad. And uh, so that was what kind of motivated me to apply for the internship. And so when I was there, I worked for a division that's kind of, it's not technically an official part of the UN, but it is an important part of the UN. It's the group of 77. Um, it was originally founded as a group of 77 developing countries, and it's now grown to be much larger than that, 131. And China is kind of an unofficial observer. And what they do is the ambassadors of the delegations that represent these member states, they meet outside of the General Assembly to strategize how they're going to negotiate as a block within the General Assembly because uh, the UN is 192 member states, and this is 131. So it's a very formidable uh, group of countries. But they have different priorities, and some certain types of problems plague certain countries more than others. So that's why their priorities are different. And so what the G77 tries to do is find ways that they can align and unify uh, by promoting South-South cooperation. Um, South, I mean the Southern Hemisphere. And then that translates into greater north-south cooperation uh, because the rich and industrialized nations of the north start to recognize that these countries are serious and uh, they're powerful and they're more willing to cooperate and you give them the trade preferences they desire and things like that. 
two important achievements of the G77 um, were the institutionalization of UNCTAD, the UN Conference on uh, Trade and Development. The reason they wanted to make it permanent um, is they were, the developing countries at that time, like in the 1960s, they were really unsatisfied with the way they were being treated under GATT, G-A-T-T, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Um, and UNCTAD was the first like, conference that really looked at trade from the perspective of economic development. And so they thought that that was important because it got people to pay attention and listen to them for the first time in a long time. So they institutionalized it and it's been recurring ever since the 1960s. And they, in 2006, they mandated COSTIS uh, the Consortium on Science, Technology, and Innovation for the South. And what that does is it aligns the universities and research institutions and ministers of science and technology and the heads of state and so forth um, to create better communication uh, and streamline everything and give these ambassadors a direct line to these institutions and also to give these institutions uh, more say in their governments through diplomacy. And so those were two major achievements of the G77. Um, one thing I wanted to make clear to everyone who's here today, and we bolded this in the campus announcements, is that um, this internship is what I call universally valuable. Uh, it's valuable to everyone, no matter who you are or what you study. Um, there's something for you within the UN. Um, and not just with internship opportunities, but job opportunities. For liberal arts and humanities, you might find uh, positions for people who study languages or communications majors, artists, uh, you name it. Um, day one, uh, which is the orientation day, I met a French girl who, um, she studied economics, but what she was doing was more of a communications type of internship. She was working for UN Women, which is the UN's new consolidated gender entity. And uh, she told me that something like 96 countries have not yet criminalized rape. Uh, so they haven't established laws, or they maybe they've established laws, but they don't have the capacity to enforce them and deal with the cases that come about. Uh, and so they try to raise awareness and promote the propagation of women's rights and other human rights, and also children, too. Um, and then education is very big. Um, anyone from sciences and technology, you, you don't have to be an economics major or some kind of business major. You don't have to study international law. There's, there's ways that the UN could put your strengths to use. Um, and I would openly challenge anyone to come to me and tell me you know, that you study this or you do this, this is what you're good at, and I'm sure that we could sit down and find a way that the UN could use you. Uh, it's a very wholesome organization that approaches problems from every angle. And so I wanted to make this explicitly clear. Um, and how many of you in here, are, can you raise your hands if you're from the College of Business? And can you raise your hands if you're not from the College of Business? OK. <laughs> you raise your hands if you're here for the Jolly Ranchers? Over there? No, two at the back. But um, so I, I encourage anyone and everyone to apply uh, for opportunities with the UN. But things you should consider are that the internship program is unpaid and full time. Uh, in fact, for me, it was more than full time. I was often working until 9, sometimes 11 o'clock at night. Um, you need to consider your personal financial situation because of that, uh, because the UN does not make any arrangements for cover any of your travel expenses or your accommodations or anything like that. Um, you'll need to consider the eligibility requirements, which I'll go over in just a moment. Um, and for some people, it's important to them to intern there during the fall, because that's when the General Assembly is in session. Um, and before I was going, I thought, well, you know, if they're not in session, I guess maybe there won't be as much happening. But I could not be further from the truth. I was there for the spring session. and. Uh, the Security Council is permanently in session, so they're having meetings every week, multiple times a week. And some of them are open, so you'll get to go and see those. Uh, there's press conferences every day. 
there's all kinds of like human rights conferences, biodiversity conferences uh, every week. Uh, and there's meetings because the uh, ambassadors to the UN are permanent representatives. So they generally live in New York. And they're right there all the time. So even though they're not in session for the GA, they're still having committee meetings and expert level meetings and so forth. So there's plenty to see. You will not get bored. And I've listed the durations for the different uh, sessions, but they're also on the internship program website. Um, the eligibility requirements are that you generally need to be enrolled in graduate studies, but the kicker is that if you've attended at least four years of full-time university, that they don't so much consider you an undergrad. Um, so it's loosely enforced. In fact, one of my co-interns at the G77 has not even finished his undergrad uh, degree yet. So it's not too much of an issue, but you, are, you do kind of have an edge if you're in some kind of grad program. Um, you need to obtain any necessary visas. If you're a US citizen, this is not something you'll need to do uh, because you're just going to New York. But if you're an international student, you may already have the visas that you would need anyway, so it may not be a, a big issue. And I'm, I'm just not too familiar with it, but there's more information on their website, which I'll link to at the end. Um, like I said, you'll have to arrange your travel and accommodations all on your own. Uh, you'll need to show that you have valid medical insurance, and you'll need a letter from your doctor stating, stating that you're fit to go and work uh, at the UN for the duration. Um, and you'll need to communicate in either English or French. Uh, those are the two working languages that are important within the secretariat. Um, so if, if you're from this university, you probably speak English already, uh, at least enough to work at the UN, so you're fine. Uh, there were some hurdles in arranging the internship, and I thought that these should maybe be brought to light for people who might be considering applying. The university has no mechanism in place to deal with students that have a change in their status because of a good reason. Um, unfortunately, if you drop below the minimum enrollment that you're required to maintain for your, your scholarships and grants and grad assistantships and work study and things like that, um, you'll lose it. Uh, and that's, that's just because there's no policy in place to kind of protect your status. Um, but I would, I don't know how I would do it, but I would maybe like to recommend some kind of policy that does kind of let you put a pause on things to go do a rigorous internship and then come back and pick up where you left off without losing uh, financial aid and things like that. Uh, my solution was to design a three credit hour directed individual research class. I don't know if these are offered to undergrads, but in grad school, uh, I think at every college you can do these at least once. Um, so I did that, and then I, because I knew the people to talk to, I went and I was able to talk to someone who manages graduate scholarships at research and grad studies, and they were able to secure deferrals on two scholarships of mine, um, so that really helped. And then through the Elite Graduate Program, which is hosting this uh, talk today, they have a travel and fellowship program, so if you qualify to be in their cohorts, um, those are things that you can maybe take advantage of. Uh, and so that allowed me to help alleviate some travel funds and also, uh, the fellowship allowed me to kind of maintain a minimum amount of employment until I got back. Uh, so designing the course was kind of interesting in and of itself, and thankfully, Dr. Spencer had agreed to do it at the very last moment, because um, I found out that I got the internship just a few weeks before the university was going to close for Christmas. So we created this course for me to extend managerial economics concepts to look at how countries and NGOs and other international bodies um, negotiate within the international relations and affairs framework uh, to achieve certain like development outcomes. And uh, once I got there, the focus kind of narrowed down to NGOs once I had a, more of a handle on what I was going to be doing when I was there. The methods of evaluation, um, I blogged my daily experiences on my personal blog. Uh, unfortunately, they're no longer online because the UN asked me to take them down. Uh, but 
I, I do have copies of them. And uh, so each week I would write a reflection on the things I observed or did the previous week as informed by these journal articles that I had been reading. And uh, right now I'm finishing the final paper uh, for this class. So the course structure, um, I kind of designed this. I, Dr. Spencer and myself and another professor had found articles uh, that would be relevant to the things I would see and do while I was there in New York. And so I organized them into this schedule that kind of paints the picture of economic development as driven by NGOs. Um, and then it really examines how the NGOs function, how they manage themselves. And so we started out looking at uh, globalization's weaker players, so the developing countries, uh, the core issues that they face, and then how different organizations uh, work together and partner to uh, deal with that, and how you would start these organizations, what kind of strategic management initiatives are important, and what countries can do on their own to uh, climb the ladder. This internship was a wonderful learning and networking opportunity. Um, the best around, in my opinion, uh, especially if you want to meet other people from around the world, uh, because the UN is really the most culturally diverse organization you'll ever find on the planet. And um, out of the 200 or so interns that were there, I'd say that well over 100 countries were represented. Um, so it was a pretty diverse group of us. And um, you will forge friendships that you'll realize very quickly are going to last a long time. Um, I was only there for eight weeks, but I, I don't know. I knew I was going to make friends. I just didn't think that, that we would bond so well in such a short time. But uh, you're there working with them. You're going out to eat with them, going out for drinks. You're hanging out with them on the weekends, going and seeing New York and exploring together. Uh, it's just a wonderful opportunity. And um, it also, it's a chance for you to kind of be enlightened and uh, become alerted to problems that face the world. Um, you become a little bit more passionate about the people that are in, living in drastically different situations than you. And you get to also become a part of doing something about it because all of the aims of the UN are pretty admirable, I would say. And um, so you get to learn a, a lot about yourself uh, along the way as well. And this is, uh, these are my co-interns from the G77. We're in Times Square. Uh, that's uh, Pierre Foyen from France and Carlos Araujo from Venezuela. And um, then we went, but we did so many things. I only can show you so many pictures today, but this is inside the museum within the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. I had outside pictures, but it was so cold that they just, they did not look so great. <laughs> so, um, and we went out for pizza. This is not even the best pizza that you could find in New York, but it was still awesome. And uh, not, it wasn't all fun and games, though. We did have to work. And uh, this was at a meeting between the G77 ambassadors and the Secretary General. And uh, we were told to go and attend and take uh, minutes and notes and stuff like that. Up on the top, along the windows, you have the interpreters up there. Um, and you, when you're at these meetings, you will have to listen to them because ambassadors will start speaking um, in their, their native languages and so forth. Um, and sometimes it's funny, depending on who's in the interpreter box. The first meeting I ever got to attend, the, the male doing the English interpretations sounded exactly like Matt Damon, and I could not stop laughing to myself. And these guys were looking at me like I was crazy. But uh, it's, it's really exciting being in those, those meetings because you get to listen to the ambassadors uh, speak. There's no spin on what they say. You, it's real. You get to hear what their real sentiments and attitudes are. And it, sometimes they speak very emotionally, so it's, it's very interesting. Uh, so the career opportunities at the UN are vast. Uh, they employ about 63,000 people. It's a very big organization. It has six principal organs, and the Secretariat is just one of them. But um, countries are starting to become a little bit more upset because the, the richer countries like the US and the UK and France 
are overrepresented within the Secretariat and some of the other organizations. And so the, the pathways into those kinds of careers are becoming more and more for unrepresented and underrepresented nationals. Um, but the field missions of peacekeeping operations are very much open-ended. Um, and in fact, I would prefer to work for those, um, and particularly maybe some of these that I've listed here. Because that, and they have some immediacy uh, to the results of you, the work you do. Uh, what I mean is like, I use this analogy, it's maybe not the best analogy, but I think it's pretty good. If the UN is building a wall and you're working at the Secretariat, you could work your whole life there and your career will amount to placing just one brick on that wall. Um, whereas if you're in a field mission or a peacekeeping operation, you're there, um, you immediately see the impact that you're having on the people. You can interact with them and you can walk the streets and talk to them. Uh, you just, you're kind of disconnected from that when you're far away in New York or in Geneva or any of those places. Um, so that's really where I would prefer to be, but there's so many opportunities within the UN. It's absolutely huge. Um, across the top here are the six principal organs, and then there's all kinds of divisions and departments and you name it, field missions, peacekeeping operations. It's, it's huge. Um, and this chart, I, I won't read the whole thing or stay on it, but if you Google UN organizational charts, this is the first thing uh, that comes up. And it's a PDF, so you can read it more clearly. Um, I wrote an internship guide. This is not just a regurgitation of my presentation today. What it is, is it's a much more in-depth guide. If you're really serious about applying for the internship, you probably want to read it, because I talk about each of those topics in much greater detail. Um, and it will, it's not available yet, but it will be maybe over the next couple days on our website, which is right there, elite at uh, tamucc.edu. And this was just a, kind of a resource I created to help people understand and give them insight to the whole process and how it works, what you might expect to see or hear back from the UN and when. Um, I, I even had advice for writing the cover letter and things like that. Um, this top link is the website for the internship program, and the second link is a list of, a comprehensive list of all internships throughout the UN system. And then there's my email address if you have any questions after today. But uh, I'll also take your questions right now. So, yes? Martin, are these links, uh, the top two links, not your email, are they going to be posted somewhere on the Elite site? Um, yeah, well, I don't see why not. We can post them, I think. Yeah. Can we post them here? Mm -hmm. Dave? Yeah. Dave? Yeah. Are, yeah. He can post them. And I, I can even actually, I, I can add them to the, the guide so that when you download the guide, they'll be in there. You can click them too. Um, but yeah, none of that stuff is on there right now, but it will be, as well as the recording of, of this talk. So. But does anyone else have more questions? Yes. You said they're unpaid, right? Yes, unpaid. What about um, um, it's kind of like whatever you can find. What I did is I uh, found, it, it was called the 92nd Street Y. And what it is, is it's a, kind of a student and intern housing thing, I guess you could say. It's run by the, not the YMCA, but the, it's like the uh, Young Men's and Young Women's Hebrew Association or something like that. And, uh, but there's, there's things like that. Um, there's people who sublet apartments, uh, Craigslist. There were a lot of interns who found accommodations that way. Um, and then just like renting apartments. Uh, a lot of people stayed in Queens. Not everyone stayed in Manhattan. It's pretty expensive to stay there. Um, so you literally have to pay for everything on your own? Yes, yeah. It's, it, it's financially burdening, but um, it really is worth it. And it was really tough for me to, to do, but I will say it was very worth it. Um, but they, they provide a list, and it's on their website. You can just download it at any time. And it's also, I talk about it in the guide. Um, they have a list of housing options that previous interns have done. Um, 
and it's, it gives contact information and some list prices and stuff. I think it's only up to date as of like 2006 or seven, but um, it was still very useful. Uh, but yes, it's uh, unfortunate that it's unpaid, but they have all the bargaining power. So, but does anyone else have any more questions? And yes. They have no money to pay you anyway. Yeah, they they're they're strapped on budget as it is. Their budget is made from contributions of their member states, and not every member pays its dues on time or in the full amount, things like that. But uh, yes, you had a question? Yeah, my name is Ben, and since I'm my major is marketing. And I want to know what this internship contributes to the marketing. Um, well, I can say that not not really like marketing from like a business kind of role, uh, because the UN's nonprofit, so to speak. But they can use your marketing skills, um, much like I was talking about earlier with the that. French girl I met who was doing communications. I don't know if you were here during that part, but um, they do a lot of awareness raising and consciousness raising about problems. So they're looking for people with like marketing and communication skills. Uh, they also release a lot of publications with data, and they try to make those look nice. Um, they try to encourage people to come to conferences that they hold um, to get people to volunteer. There's lots of different ways that I could see them using someone with a marketing background. It wouldn't be for for-profit purposes, but you know, it would serve some goal of theirs. So, Does that kind of sort of answer your question? Yeah. I could maybe look around more and probably give you a better answer, but um, you can email me if you want. The networking and you the yes. people around the world. Networking? You bring the opportunities to the yeah. area. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I didn't even think about that dimension of it, but yes, uh, you'll meet other people who are maybe study marketing or who work for a business yeah, or things like that. Yeah, the networking side of it was the ultimate thing about the internship. That was the best part. Uh, without any of that, it would have been not so great. But uh, did someone else have a question? Yes. Um, when you were there, did you have the opportunity to check how is it? Like the placing causes, like how, does, how do they decide like where you fit better? Like oh, how do they decide like where to put you as an intern? It's different for everyone. It's weird. Um, okay, so they get all the applicants and they run checks on them to see if they kind of meet the preliminary requirements. And then you're thrown into a pool and from that pool, other departments around the UN will look and see, uh, you know, they'll get stacks of applications and they'll just go through and see who sounds relevant or like they maybe would be a good fit. Um, in your letter, your cover letter, you can write, um, you, you can specifically request that you be placed in a certain area within the UN or that you be assigned to an area that would do certain things uh, if you don't want to mention a specific division. Um, and in some cases, it's not full-time staff of the UN that pick the interns. And in some cases, they're so busy that they'll have previous interns kind of select or suggest interns. Um, and that's how it was for me. Whoever was there before me, um, that group of people, they had kind of made some suggestions to my supervisor. Uh, they had looked through cover letters and kind of Googled people to find stuff about them, and they thought that we would be a good fit, so. Mm -hmm. How much did you say that the, uh, the whole program might cost you? Oh, uh, yeah, I can tell you. And I talk about it a little bit in the guide, too. And they say on their website, um, I would ex expect, at a minimum, about $5,500. But um, I mean, you can, I would just say that on average. I'm sure some people do it for less, and some people probably do it for much more, but uh, I would say around $5,500. Yeah, and it, that's including everything. And keep in mind, like, you're not going to be able to work a part-time job in the evenings or anything like that, because that's when you need to be out with other interns and networking, because that's what makes the whole thing worth its, its uh, 
Oh, yeah, that's another thing. <laughs> if you're interning during the spring from January to March, so like January and February are like the coldest months of the year in Manhattan. Uh, so I didn't have winter wear because, you know, we're in South Texas. But um, so I had to buy a, a top coat and other stuff like that. So that added onto the expense as well. Um, I did, had not even considered that as a good point. But um, so any other questions? Yes. Thank you for your time. Uh, the new UN internship is so competitive. So can you share some of your own experience how to success in the supply? My own experience, how to? How to success. Oh, how to, how to succeed? Um, really, just it's all about the cover letter. Um, because I'm sure what, what you do when you apply is you fill out this online personal history profile. And so all your information in there, like your academic kind of information, um, job experience and stuff, they might scan through that with some automated system. But the cover letter is where you have your most power. Um, so you would, I would really just say you have to write about yourself and, and make it clear to them how you fit with them, why you're a good fit, why you care, why you're passionate about working there and experiencing the kinds of things that they do, the kind of people they serve. Um, just try to, you know, market yourself. <laughs> That's really all I did is I just, I told them straight up, you know, these are the things I'm interested in. And these are how these are some of my skills and how they link up to those interests and that was it. I was really fortunate to get it. Uh, I was really surprised when I got the letter because uh, I knew in advance what the odds were. I knew in advance that there was about seven thousand applicants each session. So I was just um, thrilled to death when I got the letter. So that's the best part of the internship was getting the letter in your email. So. But I hope you guys will apply. It's a very worthwhile internship. Um, and if you're from, if you're a foreign student, then a lot of times your home country may have grants and scholarships and things like that that you can apply for to use to help support you in going there. So that's another avenue. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys apply. Yes. Um, would you recommend any sort of colleges that you may know? About? Uh, no, because I didn't really find any or really even look uh, for them because I just I thought you know there's not gonna be one that I can get in the time because I literally had just uh, several weeks to arrange the whole thing I found out and exactly like a little less than or around a month later I had to leave for New York so I can't really say that I do but the internship office website they have a page um, that lists links to potential scholarships and funding opportunities and things like that. So they, they're very helpful on their website. Uh, so, so I hope you guys will apply for this though. It's, I don't know, it's just a once in a lifetime opportunity and I loved it. And I actually have been missing my co-interns too. Uh, they both decided to extend their internship. I was asked to extend mine, but I'd only arranged to be away for eight weeks, so. But I'll see them again at some point. So any more questions? No? All right, well, thank you. So you can take a moment to fill out the evaluation form before you leave, and you can lay it upside down on the, on the table on your way out. And you're welcome to the pad if you want to keep one.